Now, you mentioned Charles Murray, and uh, you said uh, whether it's cultural or biological or whatever, and I'm aware of your big debate with Ezra Klein, was yeah. it uh, some yeah. years ago about uh, Murray and all of that stuff? Uh, you got it. You you taken any of it back, or are you still still holding out for whatever? Well, you're I, holding I was out for. I was not holding, holding out for. It. Any, Tell me whether or not the uh, positive part of his thesis, apart from the necessity of being able to talk about these things without being branded a racist, when it's obvious that you're not a racist, right? That's that was yeah. the, the the hill I was prepared to die on, right? It's not. To, I mean, I, I have the truth is I have. As, as close to zero interest in racial differences in anything as I think you can have, right? I just, I'm just not interested in the topic. What I, I am interested in is the, the silencing effect of, of the perception that if you um, violate uh, any one of a number of incre increasing number of taboos erected on the left, and by our our, uh, our most prestigious institutions, journalistically and academically, you risk um, defenestration, right? So, so when Charles Murray stands up, you know, 25 years after he wrote his infamous book, which I hadn't read at the time because I was had been convinced by all yeah. the bad PR that this was just racist, uh, uh, you know, moral pollution essentially. Um, when he stands up 25 years after having written that, having written many other books in the interim on different topics at, at Middlebury and yeah. gets deplatformed uh, semi-violently, you know, such that his his host gets a concussion, yeah. I think, or a neck injury. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it was a neck injury. A, a, a real problem there that I wanted to talk about. And, and so in, in the course of talking about it, you know, we spoke about his actual thesis, which again is, is routinely misrepresented. I mean, it's, it, when you when you look at the most controversial paragraph right. in the bell curve, which I then uh, then went and read in advance of speaking with him. I have yeah, read the I mean, bell curve the worst cover to cover. Paragraph in there is a paragraph where he and Hernstein say, "We don't know what contribution ra uh, biology and environment make to these differences." Um, it seems rational to assume that both are involved. You know, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing here. Yeah. They are resolutely oh, oh. agnostic. Excuse me for interrupting, but the words are important. Yeah, They're we, resolutely if you, if you agnostic. For us to have, have made the claim that one or the other accounts for the whole story, you have misunderstood us, right? Um, you know, we just don't know. Uh, and for that, he has... Um, he has really, he has been burnt as a witch, you know, figuratively speaking, but reputationally, it has been the case, you know, repeatedly for a quarter of a century. Um, I, I just find that to be, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there are many other cases of people touching far less uh, uh, radioactive topics uh, where now, you know, the, we just we're seeing the cancellation of people, and so I, I, he was he I, I perceived you know in, in hindsight to be a kind of canary in the coal mine, and um, so anyway I, I had him on my podcast, and that that proved to be every bit as controversial as I had reason to fear it would be. I mean I, I did I did after what so, book? Excuse me again for interrupting. After it, was, it wasn't actually in reference to the book. Body. I don't know that I don't know when he had published his last book. I think he probably the book before had been coming apart. Um, yeah. Okay. It right, was before, before human, human diversity, diversity and, uh, uh, is, is really went up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it, yeah. And so I, I did pay quite a reputational price for even having that conversation with him and giving him as much, um, you know, aid and comfort as I did on, in that podcast. But I, I viewed it as a you know, as morally important to do because it, it just seemed insane what was happening at that point around him and, and around everyone. I mean, J.K. Rowling and anyone else who's getting uh, pilloried for, for having said something yeah. that seemed, uh, you know, blasphemous. Murray, Murray is a special case. We actually, I actually teach the Murray case in my mm -hmm. course on free inquiry in the modern world at Brown, where I'm 
you know, resolutely not agnostic about the issue of whether or not you should be able to investigate such questions. Of course you should. What are we doing putting our heads in the sand? If we, and uh, what are we doing to science, uh, which is the foundation of our civilization, if we are, I mean, it's a kind of corruption of our intellectual life to foreclose the discussion of important questions based on evidence. Mary doesn't have to be right or wrong about that, but the, clearly the question doesn't answer itself. It's not a priori obvious what the answer to the question is. Question being, to what extent does biogenetic inheritance influence the expression of intellectual ability as measured by cognitive ability tests in modern society? That's a hard question. It's an important question. You get to ask that question. You, that's not a moral question. That's a question of cause and effect uh, and so on. And what manner of uh, society will we have become if not only asking the question is forbidden, but defending the asking of the question is forbidden? I mean, like right here, right now, I'm black. Everybody expects me to give a certain speech, and I'm not giving that speech. That speech is Charles Murray, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, is a white supremacist. That speech is that the line from Charles Murray to Jarrett Taylor is a short, yeah. straight line. Jarrett Taylor being American Renaissance guy, and he's a white supremacist. And, the, you know, he, Jarrett Taylor is Jarrett Taylor. He gets to have his views, too. I don't have to agree with them for him to be able to have his views, too. But that's a separate question. Uh, Charles Murray, losing ground was probably the most important book about social policy written in the second mm -hmm. half of the 20th century. It was published in 1984. It was Mary's first big book. And uh, it shaped the discussion about welfare policy to a very significant extent, especially on the right, but also in the center left. Uh, the Welfare Reform Acts of 1996 uh, uh, that Bill Clinton signed into law were substantially influenced by the work of Charles Murray in that critical assessment of the impact of the great society, social policy on inequality in America. That's the author of Losing Ground. Coming Apart, I mean, Coming Apart is a very, very prescient, I mean, Robert Putnam, the very esteemed and distinguished Harvard political scientist, basically is following in his book, Our Kids, is basically following in Charles Murray's footsteps pointing out that uh, there's an opioid epidemic coming and there are deaths of despair right around the corner and we had better pay attention to the separation and quality of life between uh, class yeah. straight amongst white people in this country or else we're going to miss the boat. Donald Trump became president in part because of the forces that Charles Murray was putting his finger on and coming apart. Uh, you're going to relegate him to uh, uh, the, the margins because he dared to ask a question about intelligence and class structure uh, in American life, of which only one small part of the uh, big compendium had to do with race, and now he's a racist and he's a white supremacist. You know nothing, anti-intellectual intellectual thugs. I mean, the people who want to shut up a discussion about this question uh, and who want to make it a uh, sign of your decency and your legitimacy for membership in society to uh, castigate and 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 uh, uh, ostracize Charles Murray, which I am not going to do. Those people are a threat to civilization, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, although I, there is one aspect of this which I'm a little conflicted about because I, I don't know where to draw the line here. I, mean, I don't even know where the, to draw the line with respect to Murray. Well, I don't know well. I mean, my only conversation with him, uh, I believe, is, was was on that podcast, and I certainly don't think he's he's a racist. But I do question why he has given so much attention to this issue, right? This is the one question I asked him in my podcast, which I felt like I didn't get a satisfactory answer to. It's like, why, why go there? Or why go there this much, right? And I could imagine... Uh -huh. Let me ask you a question, Sam. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I just want to know why he has to have an answer to that question. Why an investigator has to justify to anybody why they're investigating something. Because that's ad hominem. When you ask him why, it's as if you suspect that his motives are somehow impure. And his motives have nothing to do with the validity of his uh, uh, statements about the question. You may say that you're not interested mm -hmm. in the question, but whether or not why he's well, interested, I don't I, understand I how that's perfect. You perfect. can make a larger argument here, and you need to make a larger argument, or at least assume you're on the right side of this argument. When... Uh, thinking through the, the social consequences or just the, the, the sheer consequences of finding out certain facts, 
right? So I, I just I think there's certain forms of knowledge that are, are that, that are in fact dangerous and are best not sought, right? Or, or certainly best and if sought, best not published widely. Um, I wonder whether in the case of you know doing a deep dive on you know intellectual differences between various groups, um, we're on similar ground here. Like why do why seek this knowledge? What are we going to do with the knowledge? And why seek it? Now, I, I, I agree that we may be ambushed by this knowledge anyway. Okay, let me interrupt before. again. Let me, let me interrupt again, sir. Excuse me. No, no. I, I mean, the primary question is not about groups. The primary mm -hmm. question is about individuals. The, the, the group question, it seems to me, only to be a derivative or a second order question that arises once, once you've undertaken the primary investigations, which is understanding the foundations of human intelligence and its distribution in populations. So I don't know how you uh, police the investigation of the uh, determinants of, of human intelligence so as to avoid the uh, politically uh, disquieting uh, group comparative uh, undertaking. I mean, it just seems, I mean, and that's precisely my problem with this kind of uh, moral management of scientific inquiry. I mean, it, it presumes a kind of, well, kind of omniscience. Do you think it might be possible that it would be better if we didn't have group level data on, on all of these differences and we just had individual data, right? So like no, no one ever, we never took an inventory of what race you were or ethnic background you were. And we still, you know, obviously you, you, every individual went through, had to jump through all these hoops academically to get wherever they get. But at the end of the day, we weren't in a position to say, oh, we just looked at the MCAS scores for blacks and Asians. And it turns out that there's, you know, a yeah. vast gulf between them. Um, what do you want to do with that factoid? Well, here's, I, I know what Charles Murray's answer to your question is, and I think it would be mine as well. Sure, we can do that as long as you promise that we don't have a politics driven by the inequality and the representation of groups in these various activities. I tell you what, you, you give up your racial justice uh, uh, weapon where it, whenever the number of doctors that who are black is low or the number of people who are promoted to partner at a law firm is low who are black or the number of people who get into the Bronx High School of Science is low, you give that up and you stop collecting those statistics. And I'm happy to do away with investigating group disparity and the, uh, you know, determinants of human behavior that actually influence whether or not people excel at the at these activities. It seems to me yeah, you can't so, yeah, do one I mean, without that's, the other. Again, I'm I'm open to argument on this point, but the, the world I think I want to live in is where race and other differences between groups has but has the moral and political status of hair color currently. Right, so we just simply don't have the data on how many blondes got into Harvard last year, and nor would anyone think to have that data. Right, we don't want the data. Nobody cares. Um, how do we get there with respect to skin color uh, and religion and anything else? Right, that's where I would. That's where I think I would want to be, and uh, and that I mean, the path open to us there is to cease to pay attention to these variables.